Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here in the end of a new vi the start of a new video uh, end of a campaign ish um, in which we are looking at the IJA or Imperial Japanese Army uh, coup in Guangdong. Now I use cons commands to get to this. Uh, right now we're playing as Kamai Kinichiro, but we're he's not gonna last very long. General order three, four, five, six, nine, that is, as of this moment. The 104th Division of the 23rd Army of the Imperial Japanese Army is to be engaged in active preparation to restore order to the territory presently addressed as the state of Guangdong, awaiting official instruction from the Prime Minister. General instructions are to quell any potential resistance from hostile elements, foreign and domestic. All enemies to the security of His Majesty the Emperor are to be neutralized swiftly and efficiently. To aid this procedure and remove present obstacles, all civilian government buildings, in particular the government complex in the Lakoshu, Hong Kong, and Macau City government centers, are to be requisitioned. The previous documents will be dealt with according to military discretion, detailed instructions and times regarding specific units and commander to follow. Lieutenant General Nagano Shigeto. The go ahead. Ring ring. Yes. This is Prime Minister speaking. Is this Lieutenant General Nagano? It is, sir. Clearance granted. Do what you must. Yes, sir. Click. Cry havoc and let's slip the dogs of war. Now, this focus is going to complete, but we don't really care about hope. As well as the next focus, too. Because where we're going, it doesn't even really matter. Watch the water. Young Chuck sat, legs dangling over the edge of the quay, gazing ahead towards the lights in the night sky. She'd always fa been fascinated with the stars and recently just received a book of consolations from an older relative and added it as an 11th birthday present. She didn't ask where it came from or how she, he, he paid for it, sadly. Even the large segments of the city disconnected from power, the glare of neon and flame continued to blot out the stars by this point, however. Young Chuk cared little of the lights off Koshu's southern coast for stars, ships, or helicopters. They all held the promise of elsewhere, else far, somewhere else far away. As she gazed onward, she noticed a large gathering of lights on the edge of the horizon getting closer to strange. Few ships came by nowadays, ever since the dockyards were torched, and when they did come, they never in this kind of unison. As they drifted closer, new lights swept back and forth, illuminating all in their path. The mass of people in the streets turned toward the shore, talking in hushed whispers, which quickly turned to panic shrieks. Some began to peel away with, while others stood with an uncertain posture. The world exploded in sound, first loudspeakers screaming something in Japanese and in broken Cantonese. The screams, the popping and hissing of flare canisters, followed by globules of sparking fury, and finally hail of bullets. The crowd assumed an unnatural shape, ever-changing, twisting splashes of wreck and colliding with contorted bodies and faces distorted with, by fear and agony. As the transport crashed, and men with automatic weapons drew ever closer. It was time to run, but Hyung Chuk found herself near paralyzed at the edge of the scene. She began to turn, stuffing her book of stars into her school bag with fumbling hands. As the spotlight rounded on her, a moment later she sank into the Pacific and was far away from Guangdong at last. It begins. The Imperial Japanese Army has landed. We have lost control. Oh no. Hey, we still, we still have one division here, though. Dance of the Dragonflies. Uh, if you don't know this one, please go ahead. That one too. And nice. Boy, oh, things aren't looking so good now. Oh, regions Guangdong. Off hinges, the sound of distant explosions could be heard from a good distance away, punctuating the dirty bronze evening sky with gray smoke. An elderly Nissan pickup truck emanated a thunderous wheeze, kicking plumes of gravel in the crowd as it moved in place, an iron chain connecting itself to the gates of the com government complex. John thought as if he was coursing through with static electricity. The old type 100 felt heavy in his hands as he, and the rest of his cadre, along with a dozen others, gazed towards the chief executive's final readout. Somewhere behind him, those who had died during his final approach were laid in even rows, a brief moment of respect allotted before their inevitable interment into a mass grave. The palace guards lay where they fell, while the uniforms of their enemies were a khaki and blue linen, theirs was suit, grime, and blood. Chun could see the details of the looming complex with his naked eye, but his consciousness perceived them as mere abstract shapes, like the shell of some great unknown beast, but too angular, unnatural for the animal kingdom, something which had yet to burn. Yet. He felt a tap on his shoulder, the character in his red armband proclaimed him to be a scout. A large gash on his right cheek could barely start healing, flapping slightly as he spoke. Soldiers two kilometers away, what are we gonna do, comrade? Die, I guess, Chun said flatly, but all we know, we all know that already. He turned to the driver of the Nissan, is it but before he could finish, the truck surged forward, sending the polished steel gates to the ground with an almighty crash, its own engine finally giving only two seconds later. Without needing an order, the people surged forth, Chun and the scout with them. The troops would gun them all down, he knew, but not fast enough. To the last, I grapple with thee. Look at all this. I will tell that to him, but... Everything's kind of up, crap, Porter's Creek. Oh, we're lagging. Oh boy, we're getting cooed. What's not to love? We love it. Below target, the projection flickered while the quarterly earnings figures struggled to make themselves seen above the pink clouds mist and muzzle flare. Stacks of paper whirled through the smoky air. A small part of Chun's mind wondered what exactly they contained, but was immediately distracted by twitch out of the corner of his vision. As a black helmeted figure grappled with his gun, no time for statistics when the raw, brutal, beautiful reality lay all around. The barrel twisted back and forth, going neither direction for long. Chun lung lunged forward, slamming his head into his opponent's head ringing. The gun turned for just a second, and the bullet drilled themselves into Hitachi's men's abdomen, and the recoil knocking Chun to the floor. 
Time soon to skip ahead a couple seconds before I regain awareness. Two of his comrades were no longer standing, but neither were the two guards. No time for grief. Beats in the song. Cut out before the climax, one after the other. Were the fallen satisfied with their role? Would just be there to ensure they were all satisfied, if only for today. They took the SMG for bullets. Empty crap. They grabbed a fallen pistol from one of the Hitachi guards and fired a couple shots blind to the desk. No way of knowing that they made their mark. He rose, diving and sliding under the desk, sweeping away pages in office detritus. Filling his universe with sparks and lead. No use of precautions when the world made too little sense for them. A helmet of shadow, lo shadow loomed. He was staggered back again and again until Chun's magazine lay empty. As he crashed to the ground, he pulled his knife. He wasn't done yet. Well, this was a worldly madness in which he expected to spend the rest of his life. And it was for once life with a purpose beyond delaying further suffering. The blood, the dude's effing blood. A figure entered his peripheral vision. Chun started to raise a knife. No, wait, Kenton, he's a friend. They had to keep moving. Kamai would have his guts spilled open this day. He could still move to ensure it. We could be heroes just for one day. <clears throat> and we have a couple of green tea to keep us nice and uh, occupied. As everything's burning around us. Ah, oh, fantastic. A panic room. The doors were about to be shut in on him. And a good thing too, come on, fuck am I. Let's see those rabid pack animals chew their way through two feet of reinforced concrete and steel. Inside, it will be safe. Safe under the main floors and what felt like miles of maintenance tunnels with three weeks full supply, a phone and some reading material, and four armed guards just in case. Only a short amount of time now before the army cleared away, the vermin away. He could finally start tightening the screws. Nagano might be a problem for a while, but Kamai imagined the problem would go away as soon as the brute had to divert the breath, breath of his intellectual capacity towards tying his shoelaces. He moved forward to press a button. The lights went out. For a moment, Kamai's heart skipped a beat. Before the backup lighting kicked in, fulfilling his vision of a dull red throb. Emergency power still worked, therefore, so with the door. Nice try, Vermin. He signaled his bodyguards back and pushed the button again, but nothing happened. No, that must have been a mistake. Kamai pressed it again, and another time for good measure. The open door remained wide open, as if providing a view to his ashes. He pressed it again, harder this time, until before he knew it, Kamai was slamming both his fists on the controls. The soldiers turned to him, sir, he began. You, Kamai cut in. Just don't stand there, help me pull this. He and the soldiers gripped against the side of the door, tugged as if their lives depended on it. But it would not budge. In the distance, the sound of gunshots and heavy footsteps. Kamai darted into the fortified room. His mind became filled with little but inarticulate terror as he felt the end approach. Yet he managed to bark one more order Defend me, this can't be the end! Mr. Smile Man's gonna go bye bye. We did so well here. What happened? Oh, look at this. Oh, these are heads. Heroic bloodshed. <laughs> the blast of kissed shock and resounded down the maintenance tunnel, bursting pipes and setting plumes of steam into the air. One of the guards screamed and dropped to his knees as a plash of crimson barely distinct against the crimson flicker of the backup lights. Kid advanced a few seconds before the rest of the troops opened fire, turning his body into a mass of breathing globules. Just three of us left, thought John, and three of them. They fired a few shots blind in the smoky abyss and would be met with a barrage of automatic weapons fire from his own cover under a maintenance trolley. Chun of the shotgun towards him with his foot. A man knew he only knew as you began to let a down of cocktail. They looked at each other briefly, nodding. Both leaned out to the sides, Chun providing a covering blast with a flame bottle made its way to the enemy line. Buckshot careened into another man, knocking him spreading you against the door. However, no sooner had the burning cocktail escaped you his hand than it was pierced by rounds, spilling its molten contents all over him and the man next to him. Their screams were inhuman as the flames charred their flesh, crying out for help that Chun could not provide as these flames advanced towards them. He had to move and kill him quick. Shotgun in hand, Chun pushed forward and dived on the trolley. Wire. Wild, wildly firing as he careened through the steam, hell, ha, uh, fire and hellish red. His arm felt as if it was about to shatter into a million pieces, and he nearly topped over as a stray round grazed his leg. But he kept firing, firing for a like hours, eventually, until the jolly huddled, thudded against the wall. He struggled to right himself. The final two guards lay dead. Chun's eyes wandered around the fort shell of the panic room, until at last he found the cowering, whimpering figure of Chief Executive Kamai. Despite himself, he chuckled. Get up, he said in Japanese. Nothing lasts forever, Chief Executive, especially in this city. And from X Art. For some reason, Chun expected the skies to clear, but they were dirty. Um, bronze all the same, as he and Kamai exited the government complex and later prodded along by the muzzle of the foreman's rifle. Or former's rifle. It appeared that the army had only just arrived and were preparing breaching tools for the hastily constructed barricade Chun's comrades in place after getting in. A couple even flinched upon seeing him, the chief executive, as they snapped to a firing position but made no further moves. He thought he could see the eyes watching from nearby buildings. Maybe some things had never changed. Soon enough, bodies would drop over their time in Guangdong, and Japanese boots would sneer over piles of Chinese corpses. Further misery would be heaped upon his family if they still existed. Chun hoped they did, and hoped that they would still would. Still, he couldn't expect what so many of the good people had been denied, and it wouldn't matter soon. Kamon continued to make a series of unpleasant noises, though, would, though those would at least end soon. Still, this time, just this once, he could do something which could not be undone. Something to inspire pride. He couldn't feed a man on pride, maybe, but it would fall to others to finish the job, but this, the way would be clearer. The soldiers looked at Chun, Chun looked at the soldiers. Kamon gargled, eventually, Chun opened his mouth. We're expecting a speech, I have nothing left to say to you. The trigger fired, Kamon's body crumpled to a heap, and before he knew it, Chun found his own in a similar position. Make it count, he thought, make it count, and that was it. I stab at thee. Kamai Kensho dies. With the death of Kamai Kensho, the government and cabinet are in complete disarray. No authority from the Guangdong people's anti Japanese guerrilla, death to the Japanese invaders, avenge Li Chun. And maybe Mozambique, but who cares about Mozambique? 
Uh, I think we read this one before, so you can know, read this one, please go ahead. And... Knock, knock. Long May and Y sat back with their backs against the wall away from the door. Knock, knock. A sharp pain shot up Leong's leg, but he dared not make a sound or move in any way. Knock, knock. May's eyes locked on to a che rat chewed corner of this carpet into afraid edges of a fa uh, fathomless decay. Knock, knock. Y knew something had happened to her brothers, but the presence of the man outside made the feeling beyond even comprehending, let alone processing. Knock, knock. The bare, unfurnished space between them was barely four strides apart, but held the appearance of an endless ocean. Knock, knock. Sadly, the Lee family sat still hoping against hope the man would simply go away. Knock, knock. But now, hope was beyond them. Knock, knock. Wang Dong is under martial law and will never be the same again. We change to the end of the corporate's element, National Focus Street. The status of Wang Dong involves the martial law. All sorts of laws passed since Suzuki Senior have been nullified. The Imperial Japanese Army killing Wang Dong. Alarming news. <clears throat> From Guangdong, the Imperial Japanese government. Alarmed by uncontrolled rioting and company rule dependency of Guangdong has exerted its right to preserve order and lo ordered local Imperial Japanese army detachments to overthrow the government. Believe its chief executives were about to run home. With the IJA assisting control of all government organs and uh, media outlets, what communications are still emerging from the Pearl River Delta shows increased signs of Japanese control. However, it's clear that beyond the force common in the city centers, Guangdong remains in flames. The fact that dismays many observers, particularly those in China. They cannot buy the way free, could they? And look at Nagano Shigeto. I wonder why he was here. What about him? Please go ahead. Get more division and attack. Organization, division. Uh, division, organization, and attack. But we lose a whole political power every single day. We're in the red for stability and war sport, but you know what else is new? Sass Guangdong. Oh, God. Finest money can buy. Military state. Oh, crisis on the Silicon Delta. Military advisors. And we've got good fiscal health, though. Oh, never mind. Martial law. Remaining homes. Imperial Japanese armies assume direct control. Compliance is mandatory. Offenders will be shot. Wow. But a failed experiment. What was the city of Guangdong? A political entity? An economic powerhouse? No, the status quo. A city of Guangdong was an experiment. A fruitless venture. A trial which yielded worthless and unproductive results. A withered perished specimen which now serves no purpose. Experiments that do not bring forth benefit and worthy results are disposable. They're merely expendable items of zero value. Guangdong did not fail due to, its, due to the temporary issues which plagued its existence. Guangdong had come to the corruption and felt present within the very nature of its design. A deplorable state apparatus constructed with the sole intent of contributing to gluttony and avarice. We're the ones returning the territories of the Pearl River Delta to the rightful place. We're the ones shattering every contraption in this apparatus of greed. We're the ones reestablishing the righteous and glorious tenets of Pan-Asianism into this shameful land. What the weak and incompetent men of the inept and disgraceful corporations could not do, we're executing with the intensity of a thousand suns. We look upon the mess you have made. We look upon what you, look what you made us do. Well, we have a division. 109th Training Division, huh? Wow, why do we have 27 come with? Whatever. Uh, flat circle. A lone body crumpled over the balcony, doing a kind of twisted somersault before smacking face first into the tarmac. Gray man is sleeping into the ground at Nagano's feet. Another looking rifle landed on the ground a moment later, and the breach bent open. Nagano scrapped the gun off his boots, kicked the body over, and peered at the weapon. But effing air gun, stupid dude. He instructed the man in front of him to fan out look for any other hobbyist uh, snipers before turning to the soldiers behind him. Still mopping up, they've been caught in a relatively short distance, and the mob has surrendered. Sundered on even through the live rounds, leaving just enough time to order the men to fix bayonets, even them. They kept charging, stupid dudes. A low, discordant moan of agony filled this ambience of the scene, even through sounds of battle and distance. Some of the men had made it, and the ones who had were uh, splattered with black, pink, and red, as if they had put on camouflage for the inside of one's intestines. Perhaps not a bad idea, thought, on the disemboweled piles of flesh below the feet. They get a step forward to help the troops kick the bodies into something resembling orderly piles when the radio operator ran up for him, towards him, giving a breathless salute. Well, out, of it, out with it, soldier, Brock Nogano. Sir, it's the guy to the government complex before us. Come on, he was killed by a dirty, stupid Chinese monkey. That's who said Nagano's voice low. Say you'd be too young to remember Nanjing back in 37, right? Probably not even born yet, am I correct? Yes, sir. Then watch and listen closely to the in the days that follow. You and they are about to receive a very important history lesson. Close up shop. Everything must go. Everything. To truly cleanse this spoiled land and introduce righteous and just rule, we are expunging any trace of the former corrupt system of governance. The depraved and gluttonous tyranny of the corporations that have tainted every corner of the state. The supreme symbols of the era of duplicity and subversion are the virtuous maxims of Pan-Asianism. They bring utterly and mercilessly demolish our fists and pulverizing the remains of the regime of unbridled corruption and the decent and vile drugs who participate in the operation of these organizations of vanity are being eliminated. The memories of them and their reprehensible deeds perishing the ravenous fires of exp expurgation. The contemptible vices that have kept Guangdong in fetters are being destroyed one by one, and the corporation shall follow. No time to talk. What do you mean Chun's dead? Asked Mai. He can't be dead. Don't say such ridiculous things. He has not to come out with him, Roar Hey. You know what that means, right? They're going to be coming here any minute now. And it looks like they're going to even possibly be, uh, might even possibly be us when we'll be killed. We need to move and move now. Long, May, and Wai didn't move, nor did they speak for a while. A gunshot sounded in the distance, far off yet still too close to comfort. Seeing a jolt through the whole family. They ran to the door, passed the power down elevator doors, and down flights of stairs. Hay slammed and opened the entrance doors, only to immediately see five soldiers already covered in blood running at them and screaming in Japanese. 
There was no time to think. He shouted his family to run, and even without taking time to see if they did, turned and barreled into one of the soldiers, the momentum knocking him flat on his back. Now this was quite in line with his skill set, a part of him registered with something like a mild amusement, even as the rest of him was fueled by incandescent rage. He spat in the face of the fallen soldiers before jamming his thumbs into the socket, screaming in inarticulately. That, this only lasts a couple seconds, however, before the metallic shiver of a bayonet pierced the back of his abdomen. In the last few seconds of life, Hayes spat out a, a cloud of blood, which had risen to his mouth onto the soldier, then collapsed one last stop trailing through his mind. I hope it was worth it. Close up shot, my friends. Everything's falling apart. An official statement from the office of Gao Zongwu, from the President of the Republic of China. I and the government and remaining free citizens of China condemn in the strongest possible terms the actions of the Imperial Japanese Army. And the government of Japan has ordered them within the province of Guangdong, while the existence of the so-called city of Guangdong can only be described as an exercise in indignity. The establishment of a direct military rule over the province are an unforgivable attack on, upon China's national sovereignty and an act upon sadism upon Guangdong's populace. The Chinese have carved out their destiny in Guangdong since the days of the Qin Shi Huang, and it's where the foundations of the modern Chinese state were built. It's the birthplace of the great Sun Yat-sen and his rightful successor, Wang Jingwei. It's from the base with which the Kuomintang staged the liberation of China from the roving warlord bands of the earlier republic. It's a focal point from which the three principles of the people have spread their light over the Chinese people and which have now been smothered in the darkness of oppression. Japan's actions have kind of made one simple fact clear. The pan ideals of Pan-Asianism under the auspices of Tokyo exist only in the parody, and perversion, and abomination, and the Republic of China shall not allow itself nor the Chinese people nor the Pan-Asian spirit to ensure, ensure, endure such disgrace. Furthermore, the Republic of China is ready and willing to engage in an appropriate response to any and all attacks upon sovereignty, territory, and citizens within or without the province of Guangdong. The government of Japan is reminded that no actions are without consequences, and the government of China is preparing all possible countermeasures. Best wishes. Oh boy. More than one a day. Clipped wings. A packed airport lounge. Uh, straight tr trickle sweat. Bourbon glancing at watches in the massive teletext screen in the center. A small analog twitch. A CPA 51 Beijing cancelled. A CPA 52 Nanjing cancelled. CPA 53 Shanghai cancelled. Eagerness to return home. W uh, wellings of shame or self Peter and general nausea. Looking over the shoulders for men in green. Another twitch. RMA 48 Siking delayed. RMA 49 Mukden delayed. RMA 50 Hotovin delayed. A low web of panic. The product cycle is no more. And corruption. Insufficient, inefficient, ineffective, and inept. A wretched den of scum, and, of scum and villainy. The Legislative Council that has overseen Guangdong is nothing more than a vin veneer of accountability. A haven for the corrupt, fraudulent scum that passes for leadership in the farce of a so-called nation, ruling over a rotten edifice of vice, disorder, and incompetence that must be destroyed. The Legislative Council hereby, therefore effectively immediately, be dissolved, and its cohorts to be tried as traitors they are, and the buildings and offices of pur purpose for something useful. Military, military justice is swift and without mercy. Divestment. What a joke, Mother Nagano. Uh, to himself as much as the rest of the room. More than two decades in one of the most resource-rich areas of China. What was it all for? We were making cheaper television spoiling the rotten youth. Oh, well, uh, we should have been preparing. No time like the president, I suppose, replied Brig Brigadier General Murai. Uh, we'll put him in the ground yet. Just a little longer and all these assets to the chairs will be back in productive hands. I trust you've read over my proposal for what comes next. Uh, sounds like the authorities all over again, said Nagano, but these are the times. Being hands off towards the corporations, let alone these savages, was a great of error. The command council shall return, Murai. The war is coming soon. China will show no mercy after all this. Anything in the foot of taken land, not geared towards flattening Nanjing again, is worthless. Any man living here whose life is not dedicated to putting holes into our enemies may as well be considered one. No more lenience, no more complacency. Excellent, sir. Though, if I may speak freely, I'll, it'll be a bitch to get the civilians and natives to fall in line. Perhaps in a gun, but that's uh, what we're here for. He turned to the other man in the room. Wat Watanabe, you're welcome to deploy as much force as you feel is necessary. Watanabe uh, grinned. That's what I've already been doing, sir. Cutting with change to a military directed as Imperial Protectorate. Oh boy, the miracle in the Pearl River's vanished. Well, nope, I don't think we're going to make an economic check, but interrupting paperwork. Yamauchi combed through a number of documents in his office, verifying the cost of various orders, ensuring that no mistakes had been made so that all the goods were going where they were supposed to go. There was some uh, motion outside. Shouts, shouts. Sounds of heavy footsteps. Yamauchi uh, would have gone up to check if the paperwork was, was, he was sorting through wasn't as numerous, and he was also not necessarily so time consuming or sensitive. If you miss an order, operations would bang, bang, bang. Yamauchi looked up at the door to his office. The source of the sounds in the same moment was splinter as a battering ram forced the door open. Armed soldiers were suddenly everywhere, throwing open drawers, grabbing documents, and seizing financial records. Yamachi didn't know what to do. He didn't even necessarily protest when the two soldiers physically lined up, lifted from his chair. As he was dragged away, he tried to struggle and protect, protest his fate. It was all in vain. He'd be taken into custody and inevitably be thrown behind bars. Yamachi is now one among thousands. Sir, now remains Dutch. That's different. 30 pieces of silver. Mr. Hosh Hoshikawa, was it? Said the stern-looking colonel across the desk. Yes, sir. Wrong, your name is Wong. I have a cousin named Hoshikawa. I would advise you not to besmirch his good name through comparison. Are we clear, Mr. Wong? Yes, sir. Sorry, replied the once again Wong, feeling the handcuffs bite further into his skin. Anyway, I assume you want to see the results of your application? Yes, sir. 
Unfortunately, the uh, Macau Municipal Government will not be requiring your services in its foundation. Your back room has been extensively reviewed, revived, reviewed, and is too suspect for us to put faith in you at this time. But you said if I talked to a volunteer, you let me out. I made no such guarantees, nor should you believe to be owed any. The guards will escort you back to your cell shortly. Oh, I can go back there. They'll know what I said. It'll kill me. That's no no concern of mine. Three evils of Guangdong has been restored unnecessarily, or for now. A blank check. Our mission is simple. Our mandate is clear. Pacify Guangdong and its environs and the, and the violence in the three pearls and suppress any hint of dissent or resistance that is foolish enough to, to challenge the servants of the emperor. We're not beholden to the incompetents and traitors who once ruled Guangdong. We're not beholden to the fraudulent corporate, corrupt corporations who once dominated this nation. And we're certainly not beholden to the spies, traitors, and rats who are to stand against the Pan-Asian dream. We're only beholden to his majesty and the empire to which we serve. We have a blank check on hand and no trial to try us. Uh, Guangdong is being cleansed of any who dare to pose a march of progress. There are no more questions to be asked. It's time for action. A place more dear than thought. Finally, the Legislative Council will enter indefinite recess. The martial law is regrettable steps to correct the hands-off policies. Ooh, is that another division, huh? Uh, the previous governments. A model of faulty governance that Guangdong cannot afford. We measure innocent Japanese citizens that they have nothing to fear. A message we ask you to help spread. When the military men finished their remarks, a palace silence fell over the ball rooms of the Koshu Yamato Hotel. The officer surveyed the assembled no notables and journalists with a satisfied smirk until they saw Yoshiko's raised hand calling for a microphone that was duly provided. Yasukawa Yoshiko of the Canton Fujian Koran, is there any idea when the martial law might be lifted? Until Guangdong is pacified, no. The officer answered Yoshiko's question brusquely, daring anyone else to try, only for Yoshiko to continue, much to her own surprise. Will military control persist indefinitely? Yoshiko spoke almost automatically, her words swelling up from a place more dear than the thoughts of screaming that she was crossing a line. An armed camp is no safe place for business or people. We cannot answer. Will Guangdong go back to normal? She blinked repeatedly, fighting down something rising in the corners of her eyes, eventually, ever. Someone please escort Miss Yasukawa home. The officer drew his hand across his throat, and Yoshiko felt two pairs of arms locked under her own as a microphone was rustled away from her, even as her thoughts finally gave form to the cry bur bursting from her throat. This was my home. Where will I go now? The Legislative Council of Guangdong and the Basic Law, Article 2, have been declared void. Let go has outlived its purpose. Reappropriate research. We cannot deny that the corporation of Guangdong and the failures they are, corrupt and followed fraudulent they may be, have matched remarkable technological advancement. Bleeding edge research years ahead of uh, similar efforts in home islands, producing electronics and prototypes that might still be of use when placed in the right hands. Shipments of the prototypes and research notes back to Japan are well underway, where the army can turn these sparse gems of success into tools that can be serviced for the world over. Even if you are useless, your research may be of some value for us. We are not the sick men. The first artillery shell landed it short of the Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hall instead of toppling the statue in front of the building. Uh, the megaphone blared some horse crap while surrendering an equitable treatment before another barrage of threats. Kuang speaker posted with a comment about the immortal spirit of Dr. Sun, Li Chun, and the mole and the emperor's inner thigh before a couple of balls of mutual blind fire. Kuang ducked back inside of the central chamber for a fresh round of ammo and looked down upon the vast auditorium below. Couldn't just walk down here, could they? He muttered to a comrade. Be efficient to bear all pot from up here, he sighed. Just life doesn't work that way, does it? Things shook her head sadly. Guess not, she said. Shame about the statue, though. Building, too, I guess. Oh, plenty of time soon enough. Might need a new uh, plinth for Chun and all that. You know what one for yourself? Asked Kuang. You got the looks for it. Knows he knows he get, get itchy, said Fang. She paused and went, I live good enough for me. Well, I'm in the next life, I still hope. That was interrupted by an earth shattering crack in the upper quarter of the building, crumbling in on itself. Never mind, perish the thought, said Kuang. Once he could hear himself again, it's time, isn't it? Fang nodded. For a moment, Kuang's hand troubled and became firm again. He, he and Fang kissed one final time, walked down to the entrance, arm in arm, guns in hand. Hell, here's us. Any defense agreement between Guangdong and Japan has been declared void. Our approach to at least involvement of the South China Area Army. Nice. Secure the hinterlands. As you know that the force of the corruption and excess upon the banks of the Pearl River Delta, cleansing each sprawling city of degeneracy and debasement. Open defiance against our honorable cause, no origins from another source, the rural hinterlands. Avoid dispatch combos of soldiers to seize and occupy all insubordinate regions outside the Three Pearls. The insignificant pockets of feudal resistance are being vanquished. The cities brimming with Chinese dissenting inhabitants are being captured and subdued. As the first of scum so defying our authority, clinging on to uh, deluded visions of hope that long departed, are being eradicated. We have drafted extensive lists of names to keep the barrels of our guns forever warm. We are bringing forth the benefits of war and stability back to the territories, accompanied by the melody of deafening gunfire and the harmony of heavy footsteps. There is value in the three pearls. There is even some value in the land outside it. There is no value in the people who live there, though. For all I've done, for the man, and green fatigues, wordlessly accepted the lamb's badge and gun through the glass divider. Uh... Saying nothing to anyone else, Lam left the prison of what was once Guangdong's police force. Now it's just known by some overly long phrase, which could have just easily been the army's little bitch. He noticed uh, a lot of the now former Zhujin officers walking out faces equally grim. No one said a word to anybody. He passed over a bridge for a while. He leaned over the edge towards the river by now a, browdy, a brown parody of water. 
A uh, long way down, he thought it would, it would be so easy. It's what he deserved, surely. He began to lift his leg over, then pull it back down. No, it wasn't what he deserved. Not after spending two decades sacrificing some people to the grinding teeth of this merciless machine. Too easy, too pain painless. What else can you do? He could try fighting as best he could if he could find the people to fight with. And they didn't, didn't just kill him, that is. Though, he couldn't say what that would also be desirable in a way. But what to do if he couldn't fight anybody? He'd go abroad like his dad, try and get whatever, whoever he could to slay the monster he helped perpetuate. Maybe see if the old man was still kicking, but where first? What to do now? The thought of home filled his mind. He didn't know what had become of Shen Zen. Were Ma, Uncle, and anyone else still alive? Were they terrible plate pieces? Just like he probably should have been? Somehow he couldn't bring himself to care anymore. He found them first and do whatever it took to undo all he had helped cause. He eventually killed him. Let him go home. Pacification incomplete. Calamity awaits. Long live his majesty the emperor. The wheels turn. Martial law is in effect. Remain in your homes. Compliance is mandatory. Offenders will be shot. The grip tightens. Silicon Nightmare. Oh, this is slow. They're slowly taking everything over. Yard sale, yes. Oh, yeah, that's a stupid thing. A lot of good men die for those stupid toys. Disbanded immediately. Send the men back to the units. Scientists back to Tokyo. Make them work for a real weapons lab. Maybe even outside of prison if you're feeling charitable. Apology cards to the families, too. It's the least we can do atone for that disgrace. I don't give a crap what stupid Zaibatsu would continue interest in the project. It ends and ends now. We are real armed force about to fight a real conflict in the real world, and I do not have the patience or the cruelty to arm my men with weapons made by the same people in charge of producing office toys. Can, can it and can it now? How many left? Are you stupidly joking? Just hawk them on whatever warlords dumb enough to take the stupid things. Break even if you can. Just get them out of our books and out of my sight, and bring me whoever's in charge of this. Going to a, a mail a piece of him to every place one of our own had to die for this crapper. I guess iron sets will have to do them. The wheels are slowly, continually turning until it's all under Japanese military rule. Well, that's one way to deal with the riots, right? Probably the easiest way to deal with the riots. Just get cooed. The boombox. The village had been turned to cinder. For uh, Sergeant Nomura's men had even taken the chance to burn him. Only a couple of char uh, ears of rice and barley remained to gently roll over the footpath. The buildings were a barren house, the only thing seemingly separated from the ancient ruins being the copious amount of graffiti. Japanese graffiti, no more chuckle. Somebody had obviously been helping these rebels with their homework. Go to heck, Japanese dudes, red chalky white text awkwardly scrawled on the one stand being left wall a lot of what was once a shred or shed. Guang Dung people ain't anti Japanese gorilla uh Dung Jung column. Took out the entire facade of one of the larger, almost inhabitable habitable looking hovels. That one listed a huge smirk from a Nomura's man. Banners running scared, playing at being a different, more effective group of bandits who had nonetheless been eradicated along the rest of the CCP. The man fanned out, digging around the rubble to see if any pretensions of violence had been left behind. Being a surgeon and all, he naturally was given first crack at the home of the village of Chief. Creeping inside, rifle and flashlight in hand, was a disappointing spectacle. The rooms were bare, room after room of assailants, graffiti, or much of anything in particular. He saw no real danger, but no real glory. Then on the table, one of the last room he saw, a Sony CF-2500. Top of the line, probably some spoiled co college kid who slugged it all the way here, playing at war. Number one review is still crying about in the hills. He stepped forward to claim, claim his prize, but feeling a slight tug at the ankle level. Wait, you're not supposed to be able to. The Guangdong Dong rats have fully been dispelled, yet other descenders have filled the vacuum. Oh, look at the Shaw of Iran, but who gives a crap about the Shaw of Iran right now? Guangdong Dong's burning, but it's usually burning. The cavender, I nod. The judge's gaze was stern, but gave no other trace of emotion. The men who flanked him were war of army fatigues and perpetual scowls. The dock laid empty. Another chair, conspicuous in the packed courtroom, was also empty. A fly buzzed past the judge's ear. He did his best to ignore it. The scale of the crimes which Kumai Kinichiro was committed in his life as chief executive of the alleged state of Guangdong, and I was supposed in death by, well, not much needs to be said. Or nearly to devote this period of the proceedings by allowing the defendant to say some words to appeal to the court's mercy, but given the extraordinary nature of Mr. Kumai's status, this would not be necessary. As the legal professionals who would have ordinarily rep represented him in such an event are presently sinking with whatever remains of Hitachi, there's nobody left to speak for him. The doc remained silent. The chair remained silent. The rest of the courtroom did not speak. The judge looked around sheepishly and then raises his gavel. All rise in for the sentencing Komai Kinichiro. The crowd failed to respond for a moment and then sluggishly rose to their feet. Sentence. Death by firing squad. The trial of Tsushida Kuniyasu. It's always a pity to see that once been a uh, sterling track record for one of Asia's most senior members. Uh, and powerful figures, and police intern to uh, dust like this, said the prosecutor, but we cannot, especially in the light of what hath it wrought, afford to be sentimental. The Guangdong Police Force was established with the interest of maintaining security in a manner which not impact the eternally growing responsibilities of our notable armed forces. But what can one say? The Honorable Commissioner chose to be soft on a terrorist threat, and as a result, we have sent innumerable Japanese civilians, police, and soldiers alike back to the families inside of ceramic jars. Maybe when this one, please go ahead. 
The judge motion for the man inside uh, the dock to speak. I reject the terms with which the prosecutor makes his case. I fail to see how at any point the security situation in Guangdong could be constructed as being designed to save military resources. I remind the court that the GPF were not only the institution tasked with policing Guangdong, nor were we the institution primarily concerned with the counterterrorism activities. I do not know Colonel Miyazaki or any of his campai time, nor equally unable to grasp the magnitude of the situation, or counter the insertion threat, or standing in a similar dock, but I doubt it very strongly. All this here excuses, said the judge. Not a sliver of remorse, nothing to inspire a sure confidence that the Japanese taxpayers' resources were being allocated to produce anything more than economic devastation and the wasting of soldiers' lives. And said so you see fit to lay the blame at others. So be it, you'll be given an excess of a time to consider with whom the blame truly lies. Sentence, life imprisonment, possibility of parole. The trial, Stanley Ho, must, must say, I don't like how you've, you've done the, up this place. Stanley Ho managed to struggle out with faltering breaths. Too much khaki. Shedder came one of the soldiers behind him, jabbing the barrel of the rifle into his back. They marched him further into the tent, where a panel of officers were standing in front of what were clearly used to be life as mess tables. The man in the middle, distinguished by a raised seat, spoke, Unfortunate for you, Mr. Ho, most of your establishments are, as we speak, getting put to use to recreate in the very environs you see before you. So the presumed judge, anyway, let us get over this with us quickly. You're accused of illegal vice, aiding and abetting terrorists, running organized, funny organized crime, treason, and most recently attempting to flee across the border. How do you plead? Well, said Stanley, struggling both to breathe and standing still, can't follow the man for trying, can you? Defense notice said the judge. Your pronouns guilty. The sentence is death by firing squad. Get to it. They dragged him off to a nearby field, the sky gray with clouds. At the edge of the horizon, Stanley could hear the, or see the border fences thronged by soldiers on both sides. One of the soldiers next to him offered a blindfold. No thanks, you boys better not miss. Good job, Federalists. But we don't care. Draw all the rest. Embezzlement, corruption, and treason, 15 years. Whipping, crying, families, patting shoulders. Gross incompetence, misuse of public funds, failure to correspond with IJ military uh, directives, treason, 20 years. A placid, unbelievable face being pushed away, abetting espionage, abuse of public trust, securities fraud, insider trading, treason, 25 years. Cries of rage, demands for hands to be removed, dragged. Dragging. Embezzlement, sabotage, corruption, and gross incompetence, treason, 20 years. A mix of the previous three reactions. Violent conspiracy, misuse of public funds, security fraud, treason, on and on and on did it go. But we got better improved processing of our processing plants. We need a battleship here in Guangdong. I think that'd be for the best. The final circle. The metal trays and did a terrific job of cooling the thin rice gruel on its way from the prison kitchen to the cells, congealing it to an unappetizing blob that neither Marita nor Ibuka felt any desire to consume, even as their stomachs grumbled from the lack of sustenance. Not like it mattered, all those years since Hitachi try. Uh, Hitachi, they might as well have gotten used to it already. Where a choice and circumstance have placed them in opposition, now fate to put them together in captivity, rubbing salt under their wounds of powerlessness of years' worth. The two spent several days in the near-total silence, of the frozen weight of years of energy forming in a frigid, all invisible wall between them, with only whispers of conversation slipping through the cracks. It would be more complete if Masashida was here with us, Ibuka said, too loudly to be speaking to himself, but without looking in Morita's direction. Why not throw those three dunces of Guangdong together for a show trial? Maybe his old man in Osaka bailed him out, Morita replied acidly. Wouldn't it be the first time? He booked allowed himself a single chuckle. Come on, got off easy, didn't he? Dead in the streets while the rest of us get away in purgatory. If only I knew I would be the first to screw it up all and first to leave. Sure, first, Marita rolled back to face Ibuka, looking directly in the eye. Now, which one was first, the coup or all the, uh, or that call between you and Kamai? You invited the dude in, and now he's dead along so many others, you want to play innocent? But hey, if you really feel like it, go right ahead and keep saying it, oh, it's all someone else's fault. Take the blood of millions off your shores. If it makes you feel better, there's nobody left stopping you anyway. Ibuka was too stunned to answer, and Marita wasn't finished. If you believe in hell, then believe me, you're going there too. I'll be saving a special place for you. As the wheels just keep on turning, turning, turning. How's the economy looking? Not good, but we have a yearly surplus still. So we could be doing worse. Look at this. Ultra, uh, nationalism against the dying of the light. Shame it had to be this way, whispered one man to the other as they were marching toward, slowly towards the platform. Yeah, shame the last thing I'll ever see is your ugly mug, replied the other. Yeah, I could say the same, he paused for a moment. I'll miss you, I really will. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere without you. If you had the chance, would you do it all again? The man asked. Of course. You saying you wouldn't? Not a chance? Another pause? You scared? And the other man said, Me too. They were top of the gallows, now each man in a long a line arranged with a noose in front of them. The officer in front of them spoke. Any last words? A noose in the line of the condemned spoke in unison before the ground gave way beneath them. Avenge Li Chun, death to the foreign demons. Will the last traitors dispose of the Koshu Tribunus fulfill its duty? The Guangdong Census Ordinance has been declared void. Oh. Traitors, that's what they are. Morita, Ibuka, Matsushita, Sony, Fujitsu, Hitachi, the executives, the Lego, government ministers, the rioters, the Guangdong police force, the Camp Pate, the Yakuza, triads, Chinese, Zuzhin, Japanese, no one, absolutely no one, is innocent from playing their part in this colossal, absolute disintegration of order and this miscarriage of the Pan Asian dream. All of them are traitors, without one single exception, and the city of Guangdong itself, for all of its disorder, all of its incompetence, all of its degeneracy, and all of its failures to deliver its own fabricated fantasies, is treason incarnate. All are traitors and will all be brought to justice as such. 
and second just as what the Koshu Tribunal shall deliver upon the wreckage, wreckage, flaming wreckages of the three pearls until no traitor conspire or dissent could be a pal. The core prosperity spheres unity and the stability of the southern China, were the wretched existence any longer. So shall the currents fall, and this unprecedented farce shall draw its to its final act. Stand and face judgment for your crimes. Wake up from the Silicon Dream. It's all a bad dream. Thus ends the woeful tale of the so-called Silicon Delta. The self-proclaimed jewel of the South is a front to the sanctity of the Dai Tua Kyoi Khan that has held onto its pathetic existence for two decades too long. The Silicon Dream upon the Pearl River died just as it had lived, a delusion, a product of artifice, concocted by incompetence in suit to in their inexplicable ignorance, tore down the pillars of order and decency only to be replaced with them, them with their heaps of gold. Fleeting gold. The dream died consigned to the deepest corners of the dustbin of history, remembered for nothing but the humiliation wrought upon the rest of the sphere for eons to come. The, pan the dream died. In its wake, the pan Asian cause has been tainted, defiled, and entire decades of fruitless endeavors have lost the void. Yet it benefits us not to linger in the past. The dream may have died, but the rising sun reigns upon it, its sh uh, smoldering corpse still. The dream may have died, but the cruel, harsh reality lives on. As storm clouds gather, and the Republic of China renegade renegades further and further against everything we stand for, this insignificant sliver of soil by the South China Sea will serve us well in its next life as a bastion for pan Asian solidarity. The granite is the most enduring of His Majesty, the Emper Emperor's Citadels, a phoenix baptized by fire and righteous fury, so that no one will ever take our ideals light and future away from us ever again. Time to end it all. The state of Guangdong will be known as the Guangdong Military Administration. The status of Guangdong involves another army area. Please give me wings. The end of the Silicon Dream will be added to our sort of laws. As the YS-11's aluminum airframe rumbled past the armored vehicles lining the tarmac, picking up speed before shuddering and lurching into the sky, Yoshikawa Yoshiko felt as if she had left something behind. Of course, she was leaving. After her outburst at the Yomato Hotel, she worried that she would not she would not understand what happened to those on the receiving end of the IJ's hour, but that didn't happen. Her name was on, not, was on a list of priority evacuees from Guangdong, something about nobility or their relatives. Even though penniless and absent from Japan for years, her family's name still had some weight to it. She left, left her job behind, as well as... Uh, editor Takasaki, who had first hired Yoshiko for her name, had nodded limply as she informed him of her imminent resignation, for wishing her the best in a thin, forced voice. Yeah, she wished him and everyone else at the Canton uh, Fujin Koran well, a forlorn hope at best. Now with yet another worn suitcase and as much money as she had left after settling her accounts. She closed the book on one chapter of her life to another uncertain one back in Japan. There wasn't much for her there, family name and some cash, she would have to do just like it did years ago. To make something of herself again if that was even possible, no, she would be fine. It was everyone else who wouldn't be. Editor Takasaki's gaunt face crossed her mind, she hadn't even been able to say goodbye to Officer Hayashi, even if he was still with the Force. There, they were still there, even if she left physically, a part of her would be trapped there too. The regions of Guangdong, must, much like the decadent estate that it once was, have become obsolete. The Long Walk. Imperial Protector, look at that. Oh, look at this guy. Taki de Agoro. Takashima Masuo. Murai Sumio. Watatenabe Katero. Well, we got no more laws. So, we got 1% poverty. So, happy June! Happy June, everybody. And we failed. Long walk. Why kept moving? They never made it out of their neighborhood, let alone Koshu. The weak dropped her in their knee, to their knees and be trampled over by those who could still move. Her father fell yesterday, her mother the day before. All she could feel were her ribs staring through her skin. Those who died in their sleep were thrown into pits. The men were beaten, the women suffered indignities, the children couldn't make it. Her brother was a hero, the other prisoners whispered to her. First martyr of the war to come. The children died for something greater than himself. Hey, died thinking she had been saved. Why lived on through inertia. As we're closing up shop. It's almost complete. Consul General, I suppose to be just Mr. Song now, greeted the Colonel of the Board Crossing. I trust her men did not bother yours during the trip. The little black limousine formed the, entire, formed the center of an immense mass of army trucks, and those in the front bearing the white sun, the ones at the back adorning the red. If I had been you, you would be all dead, replied Song. Ranks of Chinese soldiers glared at the Japanese border guards ahead of them, all sides gripping their guns a little too tightly. Charming, said the Colonel, is that what they're teaching you at the diplomat school these days? As you might have guessed, Colonel, the time for diplomacy is wa quickly waning. Yeah, I suppose it is. I'm not trading idle batter banter with you, said Song. You know who we are. Sign whatever it is you have to sign. Call whoever it is you have to call and let us pass. Of course, said the Colonel. You'll be back where you belong in no time flat. And so will you, Colonel. So will you. Background noise. <coughs> Canton Gunsai Sokan. Guangdong Military Administration. It is 8.45 a.m. Tokyo, continuing with the news. Sakurai Hidenori could tell immediately that the managing director was already at work. The broadcast audible from across the room as Sakurai walked towards his desk. 
The Toshiba radio was always turned on at the director's desk, reflecting his insistence that knowing the news was half the battle. Sakura could under always understand his argument. The city credit union served small businesses in Tokyo, far removed from international finance, but the man religiously followed the foreign news, even if he had adaged or adapted to the credit union's culture in the years after his mid-career transfer after the city crash. That was one habit he hadn't broken. Some whispered the director was clinging to the past regrets to embers of ancient glory lost outside of Japan. Sakura couldn't care less. The man's confidence was evident, churning through credit files and balance sheets like machine-like efficiency. If one had spent the day listening to Domai news agencies' overseas broadcasts, that wasn't Sakura's problem. Following the Imperial Army's pacification and widespread partisan activity in Guangdong, the military administration in Guangdong finalized the sentences of the former chief executive and leading business executives, ranging from life imprisonment and to death. Click. Sakura stopped. The sudden silence became painfully obvious that the two of them were alone. Is something wrong? Managing director Matsuzawa Ta Takuji offered a wry smile in response. Sometimes politics is a nasty business. Looking back on the Pearl River, my friends. Democratic Republic, huh? <coughs> in a quiet, leafy part of the suburban Tokyo, an old man got out of bed and put on a dressing gown. His house was unassuming but spacious, quiet but comfortable, with stairs just deep enough to bother the sore spot on his back every time he got one step further down. As housekeeper having already prepared his breakfast, he opened his front door to pick up the morning papers. No point in checking the mailbox, nobody cared enough to say anything important in the years. The phone rang, just like another, likely another scam call like they always were. He was surprised with himself for not expecting the headline. The state of Guangdong abolished. It's true, he had kept an unusual fixation on the place for all those years. He looked at them as the five companies built their Tower of Babel atop the rotten foundations of southern China. He'd see their faces wash away with the oil, then go up in flames. He had to admit, though, even after the army taking over, he couldn't believe they had screwed up that badly. So he read on. Stocks were still tanking. Anyone dumb enough to invest in Fujitsu or Sony or the other ones were forming orderly queues on the top of tall buildings. Ungrateful brats whining about the shortage of new TVs. Panic over China. Closed airspace disrupting vacation flights. Bucks already published about surviving the riots and then his name. Unavailable for comment, apparently. He returned to the mailbox. It was full of letters from various publications asking for tell -tall, tell alls about the treachery of all the men who'd wronged him, and after this time, Suzuki Taichi had held back his head and laughed. Guangdong, good night. This would definitely spark China to fight in Guangdong, probably. We'll have to wait to see when Tino 2 comes up sometime. <coughs> Calamity awaits. The broadcast continued for hours. The corrupt and seditious, the rebellious and unworthy all were sent to their fates. Blood leaked from the screens. Eventually, night fell as it always must. They had to find another way of saying goodbye, so they chose something familiar one last time. A logo for a defunct corporation flared onto the picture. A flag which stood for nothing new, for, for nothing flew in the breeze, so it was some operatic piece no one could remember. A model of the earth turned around, but whoever was watching remained fixed in place. A robotic voice announced at the end. A blank card, static in silence, signing off. The lies and deceit of the Silicon Dream lies buried, and as the as Imperial Japanese army ascends above its carcass, almighty, someday. Someday, someday, someday. As we're getting to June. No, we still have a surplus. As the economy's dying. Oh, and happy July. Happy July, everybody. <coughs> it's almost completely complete. It is pretty much complete. Look at this. Whee. Any second now. We have to give it a full week. Uh, fade and wooden stick. All the remainder of the cross that marked the makeshift grave stuck out of the mound of dirt. What would have been served to know whoever rested there, the birth and death dates have been shorn away, cast by the whim. The chilly breeze shook the gavel, gravel path that Lamb crunched on through his way to his father's grave. Autumn had come to America, the beautiful country, and the leaves peeled off the trees like flakes of gilded plaster. He stood over the grave, uh, lit a cigarette in hand. The gray slate overcast sky looked like it might rain at the moment. Lightning clapping softly in the distance. There were no more words to be said, no more nations to save. How many heroes he wanted have been interrupted or turned ignominiously like this? A rush of sleep tormented by final thoughts of disappointment, of despondency, of a disillusionment. Lamb knelt. How do we bury people back in the home country? He asked. I don't know, he answered. He had ridden him he was, had ridden through the glitz of California, through the vaunted high rise casinos of Vegas, sweltering desert air bending the mesas into a standing waves of undulating heat. The smell of incense by the candlelight, the sensation of two hands folding Offering papers to be burnt seems so far, so far. Stories uh, by Hainline, paperback casings for pulpy nonsense kept them company. Stranger in a strange land, here he was. He tied a piece of silk under that wooden stick, a reminder of what had come before when the rain fell, land was gone. Life is transient. 
existence is transitory. And thus ends a tragic tale of the state of Guangdong, devoured by the anger of its people and put down by the Japan, Imperial Japanese Army forever. He is a cry to the martyrs ring aloud that injustice is committed by Komai Kanachiro and the Nagano Shigeto will met with anger and vengeance. Thank you for playing Guangdong. We hope you enjoyed playing as much as we did. As Guangdong was created by the Japanese fiat, so too does it meet its end, with embers of resistance threatening to spark a conflagration that engulfs Asia whole. Uh, the corporate limousines and coolies once ran through the streets, now lies tanks and soldiers fighting partisans on every corner. Um, the blood in the gutters continues to run fresh as the Chinese who refuse to countenance Hitachi's bloody rain fight and turn until the bitter end. With Komai Kinshiro dead, there's nobody left to take responsibility for the weeping wounds. That is Guangdong. The Japanese defend their intervention as a necessary evil against what they do not save. Even the Chinese rush troops to the border with howls of indignation at the suffering of the brethren. The diplomats speak past each other, and soon the generals will have their say. In 1971, the Guangdong has entered history, not for the circumstances of its existence, but as a footnote to the terrible bloodletting yet, yet to come. So now, I believe that completely completes every single path currently available at the test recording on April 9th, when I'm recording this, we didn't know it's releasing a couple days later, um, for the state of Guangdong. I think I've done every route. I've done Sony, I've done Hitachi, I've done uh, this route, I've done Fujitsu, I've done Matsushita's path. So, and there's another path that I need to do that I've not done yet, of course with Sony Plus, you know, one, uh, the sub-mod at the current time of recording. Besides that one, I think I've done them all, and I've beaten the crap out of Guangdong to see what what it's really like. What it's really, really like. So, that's not bad overall. Um, but yeah, I know this would be a one-off episode, you know, a single one, but you know what? I really enjoyed it. And I hope you did too, and if you did, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. Let me know who else should I play as in TNO, and I'll see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.